Web3, the upcoming third generation of the internet where websites and apps will be able to process information in a smart, human-like way through technologies like machine learning, big data, decentralized ledger technology and more. Web3 was originally called the semantic web by Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web and it was aimed at being a more autonomous, intelligent and open internet. It will be able to interact directly with users, devices and systems in smart homes, smart vehicles and workplaces. Web 3.0 internet users will evolve from products to owners as technologies like non-fungible tokens will enable content creators to truly own their digital content. It's a strong proposition, so in this video we will explore this next level Web3 phase of the internet and how it will affect our internet experience or daily lives even. Let's get started. Welcome to the Crypto Corner video podcast. I'm your host OJ and this is episode 416 brought to you by Bityard. This is an exchange platform available in 150 countries and with licenses in the US, Singapore and Estonia. You can do spot and leverage trading on many assets, not only cryptocurrencies, but also derivatives such as crude oil or precious metals and even forex and stocks. This way you can have a more diverse portfolio so when the crypto market is down you can have a hedge in various non-correlated assets. You can use up to 100x leverage on many of these in the form of CFDs or like me just stick to spot trading. Or if you're not very experienced in trading you can follow their other members and copy their trades. You can check their stats and their trading results and you can choose what amount to allocate for the copy trading. It's all up to you and I've talked about this in previous episodes already so grab the link from the description below and check it out. By using my invite link you will also get welcome bonuses and they have a few different offers so you can see which ones will apply to you. All right. So we're talking about Web3. What is it? What does it involve? And how and when? <laughs> we are now in the second generation web experience known as participatory web or social web. Tim O'Reilly, I mentioned him yesterday in a previous episode, he's known for coining the term Web 2.0 and he's also credited with publishing the world's first website. As he describes it, Web 2.0 refers to websites that emphasize user-generated content, ease of use, participatory culture and interoperability, in other words, compatibility with other products, systems and devices. We don't seem to have reached the full potential of all of the different uses of Web 2.0, so why are we already talking about 3.0? Well, naturally you would think that we don't need to change or upgrade something until it's reached its full capacity. With Web 1.0, which was the early internet of the 90s, we were dealing with more of a one-way browsing experience. This was also called the static web, the first and most reliable internet in the 90s, but it had little, almost no user interaction. Back in the day, creating pages or even commenting on articles wasn't a thing. We were in the early stages of interactive experience with uh, the likes of ICQ, if you remember that, or Napster, although not exactly a communication channel, but forums existed not too different from email at this time. Until we got broadband and with faster speed came the ability to interact easier, real time. Websites became a lot more interactive thanks to advancements in web technologies like JavaScript, HTML5, CSS3 and more, which enabled startups to build interactive web platforms such as Skype or YouTube, Facebook, Wikipedia. Operation systems like Linux have been widespread across the tech sphere, including powering the Android platform. WordPress was responsible for the birth of self-publications, new journalism and platforms that are now integral to keep the world informed. Open source software alongside its developer community and broad user bases emphasize the importance of ensuring that the internet is open and accessible to all. Also, Web 2.0 enabled websites to be more dynamic, interactive and emphasizing user-generated content, which is already a big change. But all of this gave rise to new ways of advertising, seemingly improved by the precision in targeting the audiences, which turned the consumer into a product of the website owners. 
This is where Web 3.0 comes in the picture. It promises a decentralized, permissionless and open source alternative to what we already have built, but it will transform computing, data storage and peer-to-peer -peer interactions. For one, it should eliminate freeloading third parties by giving back the ownership of private data and enabling users to monetize it as a product. This is a complete U-turn on today's centralized model of everything, pretty much. Second, Web 3.0 will enable fractionalized and mutual digital ownership of property, assets, organizations and everything in between, leading to a trustless global macroeconomy where participants can collaborate toward a common incentive. Third, decentralized companies or organizations could become more resilient, where each stakeholder is a partial owner. At least this is the goal. Web 3.0 aims at creating this future with the help of technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things, where everyday objects are turned into smart devices, communicating with other devices and automating a vast number of daily tasks and activities. At some point, Internet-connected devices will no longer be concentrated on computers and smartphones like it is today with Web 2.0 since the Internet of Things technology will bring a multitude of new types of smart devices. Data will be distributed in a decentralized way, which would be a huge leap from our current generation of the Web 2.0 Internet, where data is almost entirely stored in centralized repositories. And I'm not against the products or services by centralized companies. Right now, it's still the norm that a platform like Facebook or a service like Skype is greatly benefiting from being operated by a company with people designated for each separate branch of the business so everything can run smoothly. That's just one example of the benefits of centralized applications. And if you've ever used decentralized exchanges, for instance, or other decentralized applications, you probably know the risks of making errors that are irreversible. This is an important weakness that needs to be addressed. Blockchain technology is already serving the task of decentralization, but the challenge really is to be able to build decentralized applications that can indeed be run by DAOs, decentralized organizations, where decision making and control is placed in the hands of the users. And we need plenty of these so that we can cover all aspects of our lives, all industries and all use cases which means we have a long way to go and we will be finding out what works as we go along since this will be the first attempt and there is a lot of room for error. Users and machines will be able to interact with data but for this to happen programs need to understand information both conceptually and contextually. In this regard we need to improve two key areas the semantic web and artificial intelligence. Semantics is the study of the relationship between words, therefore the semantic web enables computers to analyze loads of data from the web which includes content, transactions and links between persons. In practice, how this would look? Well, let's take these two sentences for instance. I love Bitcoin and I heart Bitcoin. Their syntax may be different, but the semantics are pretty much the same. Because semantics only deals with the meaning or emotion of the content, applying semantics in the web would enable machines to decode meaning and emotions by analyzing data. And consequently, internet users will have a better experience driven by enhanced data connectivity. Many are hoping that the semantic web will be the end of disruptive advertising, which is the current standard of Web 2.0. The user experience would no longer be interrupted by never-ending pop-ups and unskippable ads. Instead, users will regain control of their precious time, choosing if and how many ads they want to see and to be compensated accordingly. Indeed, I remember last year Jack Dorsey was saying how if Bitcoin was around at the time when Twitter and Facebook started, they would not have been so heavily centered around ad revenue and we would have had a very different user experience today. Artificial intelligence is another cornerstone of the Web 3.0. We already use AI in many applications and it's improving every year. There are many ways that it can improve transparency and user experience. For instance, online review platforms like Trustpilot provide a way for consumers to review any product or service. 
Unfortunately, a company can simply gather a large group of people and pay them to create positive reviews for its products or negative. Therefore, the internet needs AI to learn how to distinguish the genuine from the fake in order to provide reliable data. Last year, Google's AI system removed around 100,000 negative reviews of the Robin Hood app from the Play Store following the GameSpot trading debacle when it detected attempts of rating manipulation intended to artificially downvote the app. This is AI in action, which will soon seamlessly fit into Internet 3.0, enabling blogs and other online platforms to sift data and tailor them to each user's liking. As artificial intelligence advances, it will ultimately be able to provide users with the best filtered and unbiased data possible. Privacy also becomes a key factor for the future users of the Web 3.0. Sharing personal information will be optional for each individual, something that everyone wants. I mean, if we don't count the corporate owners and CEOs, of course, they want the opposite, we know that. But we're already seeing a change. Thanks to decentralized computing networks and storage platforms, Users can now access a censorship-resistant, reliable and unstoppable internet built for the masses. Web 3.0 aims at creating a fairer online environment as the next generation of the internet becomes open source, permissionless and increasingly decentralized. But such a large paradigm shift is only possible with an array of advanced technologies. The technology needs time to mature and the ecosystem will need to welcome all creators. There are already some pessimistic views on it, like Tim O'Reilly, according to whom Web 3.0 could be defined as a bubble and we are actually in the middle of it, he said recently. He compared it to the dot-com bubble with the numerous projects and ideas being conceived but very little product delivered which is true as of right now, but things get developed very fast in this new age because so many of the decentralized projects are also open source, meaning that developers can simply copy the code of an application, improve it as they see fit, get rid of stuff that has proven to be a weakness, add some new things. In other words, we get to build on top of already existing projects and thus we have the advance that we are building at a faster pace. I think that this is a huge advantage and we shouldn't underestimate it. On the other hand, as we've seen with DeFi and Gamify, the new decentralized model is disruptive to most traditional services or products that we have and these are all driven by powerful corporations or institutions who often take a hostile opposition. They do that by imposing restrictions or bans, bills, even new laws. So this could indeed hinder the progress that I'm talking about and Web 3.0 could fail to gain enough traction ultimately fading away without fully realizing its potential. I still think though, we have to give it a shot. I will keep you up to date with all the latest developments in this space. Make sure that you're subscribed to this channel. I bring you daily news, reviews like this one, market analysis and tutorials that help you master the crypto markets. So this wraps up today's episode of Crypto Corner. Thanks for watching and uh, take a look at the links that I added in the description below. You will find there all the tools that I use, the best hardware wallets to store my crypto for long term, the top exchanges where I buy and sell crypto, my charting tools, the services that I use to earn interest on my crypto holdings and much more. Thanks for staying until the end of the video. I'm signing off and I'll see you in the next one.